Welcome to our Good Friday service here at Main Street Baptist Church. Uh, Jen's at the piano. Danny's socially distant from me on this side. Jonathan's recording in the back, and we're thankful that you can join us, and uh, we're glad to have you here. Now, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. This isn't the way that we thought it would be. In fact, that's the theme of our day. This isn't what we thought it would be, and the great thing is that that's exactly the theme that we read in Scripture. This isn't the way that people thought it was going to be. Certainly not the disciples. They didn't think this was the way that that last week was going to be. And yet we have so much to be thankful for. And so we want to thank God for that. Now, we need you to be interactive with us today. We're going to read Scripture, and we ask you to follow along in your Bibles. We're going to sing songs, and uh, we're going to put the words right up on the screen, and we ask that you join with us on that. And uh, three times in here, we're going to just stop, and I'm going to speak for a little bit. And we hope that this will be a good thing as we get together and we think about the Lord. I don't know about you, but it's been harder this year in some ways for me to think about the events of this, what we call Holy Week. We have been busy. It's harder to concentrate. It's harder for me to just get a chance to think about this. And yet, it's vital that we do. And so God's given us a chance on this day to just stop. And stopping is what we've been doing, right? I mean, it seems like stopping is all we've been doing. But even in our busy, even in our stopping, we're busy. Our minds are busy, and our our schedules start filling up with Zoom meetings and phone calls and homework and teaching our kids all those things that weren't necessarily part of our schedule before. And so now we have a chance to just stop and exhale. And think about the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This is called Good Friday, and that's a bit of a, I don't know, it's too neutral a term, I guess, in some ways. The events of Good Friday are what are we call the ultimate paradox. On one hand, everything is atrocious and scandalous, and on the other hand, it's wonderful and beautiful. We see the worst kind of hate and the best kind of love all mixed together. We'd like to think that we do better than this, but the great king of glory, the beautiful one, came, and he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid our faces from him. So let us start with a prayer of dedication, and then we're going to sing. Father, I thank you that we have the great privilege of knowing your truth, of being able to spend time on this day thinking about Jesus and what he has done for us. On that Good Friday so many years ago, it didn't appear that anything good was happening, and yet your perspective was that the best good was happening. And so help us today as we think about that, as we celebrate Jesus, as we talk to one another and remember truths that are so vital for our memories, our our service isn't going to be very slick, and it's not going to be as amazing as maybe we had planned, but our God is still absolutely amazing. And we are dedicating ourselves, our families, our homes to you right now, asking for your help, asking for your clarity as we think through things, asking for you to speak to us in ways that we had not even planned necessarily and I thank you that your word is powerful. It will do what you've sent it out to do. And so we're anticipating that as we sing and as we read and as we speak. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're going to start by singing Lead Me to Calvary. And uh, we're going to sing two verses of that. We ask that you join with us. life I crown thee now thine shall the glory be lest I forget thy thorn crown brow lead me to Calvary lest I forget Gethsemane lest I forget thine agony Forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee, even thy cup of grief to share. Thou hast borne all for me. 
lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. So we forget too easily, don't we? Uh, some of the most important truths are the ones that we forget so much. And so it's important for us to go back and remember truths and remind ourselves of truths. And so um, we're going to read four sections of Scripture from Matthew 26 and 27, kind of that's following the story as it's going along. And so Jen's going to lead us in reading Matthew 26, verses 30 to 46. So if you have your Bibles, turn over there, and uh, Jen's going to lead us there. So Matthew 26, starting at verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples, found them asleep, and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The first thing that we see here is uh, the kindness of Jesus when Peter was trusting in himself. As Matthew is writing this, there's, there's this interplay between two sides. So we have Peter and the disciples on one hand who are absolutely confident that they're going to make it. They're absolutely confident that they are going to be loyal to Jesus in ways that Jesus is going to be surprised by. So I, I, I love this, uh, Jesus saying, you're going to betray me. And they're going, no, there's no way. And, and we get the idea from that that their confidence is based on their own performance. I think about that and some of the things that we didn't think it was going to be like right now. And Jesus is saying, if you strike the shepherd, then the sheep will scatter. What what does that mean? That's from Zechariah chapter 13. and, And it's the idea that says, if the sheep don't have a shepherd that they can see at all times, then they get really insecure and they're kind of afraid and and all of a sudden they don't know where they're going to go or what they're going to do but basically that means 
we have expectations that Jesus is going to be a certain thing or do a certain thing. He's going to act this way, and when he does, we're going to always follow him. And even if he has to die, we're going to pull out our swords, and we're going to fight, and we're going to do fine. But Jesus is going to Gethsemane for us. So this is some kind of surprise. He's not going because... Um, He's insecure or because he's fooled or he's powerless. But Peter thinks, I can be there for him. I know that I will be secure. I, I think a lot of us in the last month have had all kinds of things that we trusted in. Just kind of go poof. A lot of the things that we absolutely believed would never be lost are lost to us. And the things that we're trusting in are absolutely being tried. Are they worth it? And so here's Jesus. Luke's chapter on this, Luke chapter 22, talks about the same thing. And he says, uh, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. I, I get the idea. I remember when um, Hannah sometimes does bread making at home and so she'll get the flour and put it all together and it's necessary and I remember when my mom used to make the flour she had this old and put the put the weed in it and and it would come out and and have be all airy and that's the idea that Satan's trying to get you separate you from your faith so that you don't trust in God anymore that you would trust in yourself so much that you would get knocked sideways. But, Jesus said, I have prayed for you. So I think, this isn't what we thought it was going to be. I thought Jesus would be here for me, like he always has been. And he's not. And I thought I would trust in him better than I have, and I haven't. And I thought... Jesus would be annoyed, but he's praying for me. He loves me. He's kind. It's not like um, he's sitting there going, Father, I don't have any idea what's going to happen. That's the way I feel most days these, this time. I, I, I think of the world events, and, and I look, and I, I don't have any idea what's going to happen. But Jesus knew it was going to happen, and he says, Father, it would be great if this cup could pass for me, but not my will, but yours be done. I know that this is the direction I have to go and I will follow you. So what was the difference between Jesus and Peter besides Jesus is God and Peter's not? Jesus is relying on the strength of his father. Peter's relying on his own strength. Good Friday is a reminder that we aren't very good. Good Friday is a reminder that we are indeed undone. We were talking a little bit just before we went on the air, and we're, we're reminded of the fact that when we're together with people all the time, there's no escape from us. That our sin is there, and our need for a Savior is even more evident, and our impatience and unkindness and all those things come to the surface and we go, oh, that's not who I thought I was, but it's who we are. And Peter reminds us that Jesus is kind because we have trust in ourselves and that is faulty. Jesus is still kind. But Jesus is kind enough to say, your trusting in yourself will never be enough. You're going to need me to go to the cross. How thankful we are for God's amazing grace. How thankful we are for his unfailing love. I'm going to read the next passage of Scripture. If we pick up in Luke chapter 26 and verse 57, this is what we're going to read here. I'm going to read from 57 to 75. Luke chapter 26, starting in verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. So in between where Jen read, Jesus has been arrested, 
and now they're going to lead him to the place where this fake trial is going to happen in the middle of the night. And it's at Caiaphas' house. He's, at the, he's the high priest where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter, <laughs> here he is. Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you have said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. And they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Now Peter sat out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're saying. But when he'd gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up to Peter. Surely you are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? And so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, blinds like the sun in all of its brilliance, 
the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my that you lay down your life, that I might be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and worthy is the King who conquers the grave, and worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and worthy is the King who conquers the grave, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, worthy, 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 this is amazing grace. This is a failing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross That you lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me I sing for all that you've done for me. What amazing grace he has shown us and how desperately we need it. We look at Peter in this story and it is so easy for us to put ourselves in his place. We're the ones who trust in ourselves. C.S. Lewis wrote that pride is the root of all sin because pride is the rebellion to say that we have it all together, that we can do it without God, that we can figure things out. And yet we've had those things shaken. In the last number of weeks, our ability to simply move and do the normal routines of life is no longer possible. There's so many things that have been taken away, and we're left with the bare necessities. That's good, because it points to our need for the one who is able to meet all and to meet our deepest needs. We're going to take a few minutes to pray together, and it is a prayer of confession. Confession of our sin, our failures, our weaknesses, But confession is also our agreement with God that we so desperately need him and we cry out to him in faith knowing that he supplies. Our confession is our response of faith, trusting that God meets our needs, that he works in us, and that he's able to bring about his good will and good works in us. And so would you join with me as we cry out to him in need, in desperation, and in confidence as well. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, it is so easy for us to look at the disciples and go, if only they got it. If only they had figured it out. It's so obvious when we look at the record of Scripture. And yet, Father, when we pause and when we look at our own lives, we realize we're right there with them. They're not somehow simple or uneducated because this took place in ancient times. They failed because they are human just as we are human and our sin nature is the same as their sin nature. Father, we like to think that we have it under control. We like to think that we can figure things out. That if we just put enough effort into our lives, it'll all be the way we want it to be. And yet, oh God, as you have shown over and over in their lives and in ours. 
we can't do it. We're not able. We continue to fail. We sin. We rebel. We take authority for our own lives back from you and try to live it without you. So, oh God, as your people, we cry out to you and we ask, please forgive. And yet we also cry out in full confidence, knowing that because of this day, because of Good Friday and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, all sin is paid for. And so we cry out for forgiveness, but we cry out knowing it has been accomplished for us. And so we cry out in confidence, confidence of your amazing grace that meets us here and now and changes us and frees us and forms in us the character of Christ through the power of your spirit, through the power of your word, through the fellowship and unity and brotherhood and sisterhood of your church. And so, oh God, we confess with confidence that you, you are the God that we turn to. You are the God that we trust. Oh God, help us when we don't trust. Grow our faith Grow our understanding of your greatness. Grow your character in us that you might be glorified and honored in us. And that, oh God, we we would not be seen as strong and great and in control, but you would. That you'd be the hero, hero of our story at all points. And so, Father, hear our cry. Answer in your good wisdom and power for your glory, for your honor and so that we would be those who are blessed by you. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue with the record of Scripture by turning to Matthew chapter 27. The next chapter, Jesus is now before Pilate. The Sanhedrin has turned him over. They don't have the power, the authority to uh, bring about capital punishment, but they know who does. And they've put Jesus in front of Pilate for that very purpose. Matthew chapter 27, verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And so Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called Christ. For he knew they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. The governor said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water, And washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought I was going to be able to stand when Jesus was arrested. I thought I was going to stand for him. I thought I was going to fight. 
Peter denied. I thought that if Jesus was so powerful, then he wouldn't let bad things happen. Have you heard that? Maybe you've thought it in these days. If there was a good God, maybe he wouldn't let bad things happen. So maybe he's powerless or maybe he's not good. But here we have the ultimate good submitting to ultimate evil. Submitting for a purpose. It was not that Jesus was impotent without power. It was not that he was surprised. It was not that these evil people had gained the upper hand. He had all all authority and all power. He had the opportunity to call angels from heaven. I read in Matthew 26, verses 52 to 53, and part of these chapters that we haven't read today, that Jesus said uh, to Peter, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I could now pray to my father and he would provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Can you imagine all these angels coming to protect Jesus and they would have done it at a moment's notice. And so in no way was Jesus like surprised. Instead, Jesus is showing what Isaiah 53 talked about. You shall make his soul an offering for sin. That there must be a pure lamb that is sacrificed so that the sins of people could be forgiven. The first thing we see is that we're not so great, that we, along with Peter, thought that we would stand and we end up not doing so well. But the second thing we see is that Jesus is far more gracious and glorious than we could ever have hoped for. And that is the gospel. The gospel is that I am far worse than I'd ever believed myself to be, that i had hoped to be. I thought maybe I could surprise people or that maybe my best foot forward would be good enough, but the gospel cuts me off and says, your sin is so bad that you deserve eternal punishment, but... The gospel also says, and God is so good that he is better than you could ever hope for. His grace is greater than my sin. Romans 5 says this, For if by one man's offense many died, meaning Adam, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. I thought my sin wasn't so bad. But it was bad enough that Jesus willingly went to the cross. Bearing my guilt and shame. So that I could be forgiven and made righteous. What incredible grace that is. What incredible things that we celebrate on this day. It's more than we can hope for. So what is our response? Well, one response is, I need that. And if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, then you must agree with the bad and also with the good that you are worse than you could ever hope and that you cannot in any way rescue yourself, but that Jesus Christ was kind enough and gracious enough that he died on the cross for your sins. And then we say thank you. We can never repay, but we can say thank you. Let's sing about that. reserved for me. 
Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. By your perfect sacrifice, I've been brought near. Your enemy. The riches of your glorious grace, your mercy and your kindness know no end. Your blood has washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Lover of my soul. go back to our scripture reading in Matthew chapter 27. So this is going to be starting in verse 32 and reading to verse 50. And it's uh, going to describe Jesus going out and being crucified. So Matthew 27 verse 32. Now, as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified, who were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. 
Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard it said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Your name is cursed, and my name is praise. But it wasn't always this way. The world was waiting for you, the prophesied one. The one Micah predicted in Bethlehem, come. King David named you Lord a thousand years before this day, which is why I find it odd that your name is cursed and my name is praised. You're the image bearer of Isaac following his father. You're the one Isaiah saw as a lamb led to the slaughter. The psalmist called you a stone rejected by the builders, and Jeremiah knew you'd be betrayed for 30 coins of silver. So how did you not know that this would be the end? Did you not know your betrayer would be a friend? It's always a surprise who will backstab us. I should know. Because your name is Jesus, and my name is Barabbas. Yes, I heard about you. You're that teacher the Pharisees despise. You tell the blind to go in peace right after you open their eyes. You command demons to come out. You heal the crippled and the deaf. The lepers shout your name. You told Lazarus to wake from death. But if you are so powerful, then why are you on that tree? Why am I the criminal on this hillside standing free? Why didn't you speak up? Where was all of heaven's descent? We all know my name was guilty and your name innocent. Those should have been my chains. That should have been my road. Now your name is crucify and my name is let him go. That was my flogging, my beating, my skin. But now your name is death row and my name is forgiven. That was my spit, my ridicule, my gasp, my worry. That was my Via Della Rosa and my burden that you carried. Those were my thorns. That was meant to be my crown. It should have been my blood that was dripping on the ground. Those were my nails, my wrists in wretched perforation. Those were my desperate lungs resisting suffocation. That was my punishment, my wrath, my justice on display. Do you see? My name is death and your name is pain. Are you, Jesus, to sacrifice for liars, for cheaters, for the rotten, for thieves, for a good man one might die? But then, 
why would you die for me? Do you not see my anger? My wickedness and malice? I know your name is Jesus, but do you know my name's Barabbas? Are you a friend of sinners? Why invite me to your table? Do you know I was a murderer? I am Cain, you are Abel. Are you the father run to me? Because I am prodigal, unworthy. My name is undeserving, but your name must be mercy. I am Gomer, unfaithful, but you still call me bride. I am one who ran away. Your name is Leave the 99. My name is Fatherless, abandoned. Your name is Welcome Home. In a world of dreadful kings, you're the king who left his throne. Do you not see? This is a scandal. How reckless could you be? That was my mocking you endured. That was my place on Calvary. That was my spear that stuck into your side. That was my sorrow, my grief, my suffering in your eyes. Years of my rebellion. Years of condemnation. Who are you to hang them having my humiliation? That was my sin, my shame, my payment, my cost. You took what I deserved. Jesus, that was my cross. And even if I doubt it, never followed you. You humbled yourself into death, followed through, taking up my cross, brutal and rugged, because your name is love. And my name is passage I just read, I have two things that stick out to me really 
just blatantly. The first one is the mocking that said, he saved others himself he cannot save. Often Jesus had said to people, your faith has saved you, go in peace. And the Pharisees were making fun of him for saying that. You have no right to save anyone else. You're not God in the flesh. You are an imposter. And either that was true, or Jesus must go to the cross to fulfill what he had said to people. In saying, your faith has saved you, go in peace. What he's saying is, I'm going to one day die for your sins. For Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and for the lady who was caught in adultery and so many people, Jesus was saying, I will take your sins on myself. So when they were mocking him, they were actually showing the theology that they believed. They didn't believe Jesus was God, but Jesus was proving he was God even as he died for sins, for their sins and for our sins. And so the first phrase that sticks out is, you saved others, you can't save yourself. And the second phrase is, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't know how to explain it. I don't understand how one part of the Trinity can look away from the other. It's a mystery. But the truth is, Scripture says that on that cross... Jesus was there bearing the sins of the world on himself and in doing so, the Father turned his face away. He is of purer eyes than to behold evil and he is looking at Jesus and saying, you are the necessary sacrifice, but you are the substitutionary sacrifice. There's no one else that could do it, but in doing so, Jesus was saying, I am taking Andrew's sin on myself and I am willing to give him my righteousness, this great exchange that we cannot imagine, but it's true. Jesus is forsaken by the Father, taking our transgressions, our iniquities on himself. He was delivered up because of our transgression. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He who himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross. He died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God to redeem us to transform us. The good news has very little to do with becoming better morally. Oh, I think that's the result of this good news, but that's not what God came to do. Jesus didn't come at Christmas, what we celebrate at Christmas. He was not incarnated and become one of us so that he could say, hey, uh, I want you to be the best version of yourself. I'm going to make you a better you. What he did was to rescue us and to give us his righteousness as we put our faith in him, then we can have God's righteousness. He was forsaken so that we never had to be. These days, there are so many people who are lonely, so many people who are hurting, so many people wondering what God's doing. And I don't have all the answers, but what I can tell you is that God is working, and I know that based on what we are celebrating on Good Friday. That in this hard time, in this darkest of times, we have a Redeemer who from the darkness says, I'm not going to tell you all that's going on yet, but what I will tell you is I have done what is necessary for your greatest problem, and I will be with you in all your other problems. Will you trust in me? And so, we need to. Now, we said this isn't 
what we thought it would be, and our whole service isn't what we thought it would be, and, and Good Friday wasn't what the disciples thought it would be, and when they left that day, there was a lot of questions, and, and I'm sure all day Saturday there was a lot of lamenting, a lot of, I don't understand. And I find that that might be some of the most helpful truths that we can have right now is not only did Jesus take us, but he also understands our lamentations, our crying out for God and saying, God, I don't understand yet. And he says, that's okay, cry out to me. And so I'm going to lead us in prayer of thanksgiving, but also a prayer of lamentation that we who have confessed our sins and we who have received the righteousness of God have these dual roles of thanking God and praising him, but also saying, God, I don't understand. And would you please make the wrong right? And would you please give us mercy? And so let's hold them both. Let's hold them both faithfully. Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you that we have the opportunity to celebrate him today and every day. We thank you for your kindness in showing him to us and your kindness in allowing in our language to have your word so that we can read it. So your word gives us light. It gives understanding to our simple uh, natures and, and it gives us light about how we are sinful and it gives us light about how we need you and it gives us light about your rescue and how you offer forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And so I pray that each one who's listening today would know that the gospel has been applied to them, that they would have accepted Jesus Christ's good offering of his taking our sin upon himself and giving us his righteousness, that we would repent and run to you and find that rescue that we need. And then, Lord, I pray that those of us who know you would hold both these truths in our hands. The truth that says, thank you, and we celebrate Jesus, and we're so grateful for what he's done, but also that truth of lamentation of not being sure what is going on or if we're ever going to be able to make it through this and about what the future holds, and we cry out to you, our Father. You understand we're your children and you understand both of these things. And you don't say that lamentation means that we aren't praising you and you're not saying that if we're praising you, we won't have lamentation. These things are real in your word and so we cry out, oh Father, thank you. Oh Father, help us. You are our deliverer. You are our shelter. We need you more than ever. As we have these days where we're living kind of in the Saturday, it feels, between Jesus' death and resurrection. May our hearts be focused on your promises and may we celebrate them well and credibly. And may we be focused on the lamentations as we cry out to you our cries for we know that you hear and you care. Thank you, our Abba Father, for the grace of Jesus Christ so that we can come to you and find all the mercy and grace that we need right now. So we can boldly come to you. And so we say this in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. We're going to finish with one last song. It's a good one. In Christ alone, my hope is found. So we hold these truths, this celebration and this lamentation with hope in who Jesus is and what he's promised and I, I particularly love that phrase in the last verse. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. So, do we fear death? Yeah, yeah we're kind of concerned. Uh, we're, we're, we're walking away from each other. We're separated. We're concerned about all the things and viruses. And we hear these, these scary statistics. And yet in Christ, everything's changed. And so we don't need to have guilt and we don't need to have that fear of death. So let's sing this together and praise to God. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone the solid ground, firm through the fiercest round and storm. 
What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless fame, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. Commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man. Pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Well, thank you for joining us on this uh, occasion, and um, we truly hope that this has been a blessing to you, that you've had a great time to just think about Jesus and respond to him. And we hope that this day is a really good Friday as you think about God's grace and kindness in Christ. God bless, and we'll see you again.